Julius Avola was an Italian philosopher who wrote the majority of his books over 50 years ago. So why are a bunch of alt-right Nazi dudes suddenly really interested in him? The answer to that consists of two things that Avola provides for them. Those are tactical rhetorical ammunition and a philosophy that supports their worldview. Before we get into that in more detail, let's real quick do a profile of the kind of brain geniuses who have really been enjoying Avola lately. Um, like you mentioned with Netflix and chill, uh, what I find funny about that phrase is that we, the more you take it apart, the more it's actually a complete nonsensical signifier for basically just, it signifies in someone's head that they're going to experience something that feels good. But if you take it apart, you know, Netflix, it's just a, it's just a streaming service. That's like saying you're going to use Google or something. It doesn't really make any sense. And chill is like the implicit thing of, of, um, you know, it just means sex. Enlightening. In general, Evola is not well known, and his obscurity is actually tactically important for his fans because it means people don't have an instant association with his philosophy or with his ties to Nazism. Widespread knowledge of him would actually damage their ability to stealthily spread his ideas. His obscurity also allows them to employ defenses of Avola that will sneak past the unfamiliar observer. To the claims of, oh, he was a fascist, they can respond. After the Second World War, Avola was put on trial for accused involvement with the fascist regime of Italy, but he was acquitted. He was found not guilty. And OJ didn't kill anyone, right? To people saying, but he worked with Mussolini and Heinrich Himmler, they can respond, oh, but he was never a fascist party member and the fascists even tried to censor his work. Which is true, but they tried to censor him because he wasn't the right kind of racist for them. If you don't know his history, these talking points can be disarming, and they can allow his proponents a rhetorical in. Although Avola is obscure in the wider world, awareness of him is a shibboleth for fascist intellectuals. The fascist terrorist groups that formed in Italy in the 70s and 80s following his death referred to him as a beacon and his writings were required reading for members of those groups. Just mentioning Avola's name in passing indicates that you have a knowledge of the deep texts of the fascist worldwide subculture. If you have heard the name Julius Avola before, it's probably from when Steve Bannon mentioned him, although he's also been mentioned by Richard Spencer and Putin advisor Alexander Dugan. Their actual familiarity with Avola is kind of irrelevant. Just mentioning his name is enough of a dog whistle to get Stormfront drooling. And if they were mentioning his name without being really all that familiar with his writings, they wouldn't be the first. The fascist groups that I mentioned earlier that formed in Italy spoke highly of Avola, but they had simplified his ideology into something easier to understand. I'll discuss that more later. Avola was also a prolific writer on topics like yoga, Zen, Buddhism, magic, and the Holy Grail. This makes Avola an easy entry point for people interested in those vaguely woo topics and can lead them down the rabbit hole into white nationalism and fascism. David Icke is a modern example of this same path. Although his books on lizard people may sound like fanciful craziness at first sight, upon deeper inspection they rely on an array of anti-Semitic cliches. This woo also allows Avola's fans plausible deniability regarding their interest in him. Yeah, I'm not really into the fascism stuff, I just really like the yoga. The ideology of the alt-right is in so many ways just a reaction to the neoliberalism of the past couple decades. And although Avola wrote the majority of his books almost 100 years ago, his reactionary bent is oddly familiar. He was anti-democracy, anti-feminism, anti-egalitarianism, he hated the consumer culture, he was anti-communist and anti-socialist. And although those ideas were reactionary even then, he made an effort to recontextualize them as something fresh and important. Evola referred to his ideas that stood in opposition to all those things I just listed as traditionalism. Now, this is somewhat speculation on my part, but I get the impression that Evola did not have a particularly happy childhood. For one thing, he never mentions very many details about his childhood, despite having written like a hundred books. And following his return from World War I, where he served as an artilleryman, he did a bunch of drugs and then strongly considered suicide. He says that he was saved from suicide by an illuminating event while reading a Buddhist text regarding shedding the sense of self in an effort towards transcendence. Somehow though, 
he ended up taking the exact opposite message from that text. The illumination that came to him and that made up the bulk of his writings for the next several years was extremely concerned with identity, but specifically his identity as a straight white male aristocrat. The illumination that eventually came to him described a universal truth of an inherent and unchangeable inequality of all peoples, of a strict and divinely mandated hierarchy. And I will give you one guess as to what combination of identifying demographic characteristics were at the top of that hierarchy. Well, Evola borrowed Blavatsky's idea of root races, and he believed in an Aryan Roman super race that held a divine spark passed down from the ancient Hyperboreans, who were an ancient, not actually real, Arctic white super race. And that spark made them superior to non-Europeans. Evola's fans will try to confuse this issue by saying he believed in a spiritual definition of race, not a biological one. And while that is true, it in no way contradicts the idea that he believed in a racial hierarchy with Aryan Romans at the top. And he thought that the only way for women to truly realize themselves was to be lovers, to men, or mothers. These traditional decrees regulating a woman's dependency can also be found in other civilizations. Far from being unjust and arrogant, as the modern free spirits are quick to decry, they help to define the limits and the natural place of the only spiritual path proper to the pure feminine nature. And he also called himself a baron, and he always wore a monocle, and a fancy suit. You describe him as arrogant, and I mean, there is an arrogance. I mean, there's, there's something also rather tongue-in-cheek about him, actually, I would say. I mean, with his with his monocle, for example, I mean, it takes a certain kind of takes a certain kind of sense of humor to, to wear a monocle, in my opinion. Also, he wasn't actually a baron. At most, he was a distant relative of a minor aristocratic family. So yeah, his philosophy did put him near the top of the hierarchy. And it's pretty obvious, based on all that, why modern alt-right types like him. Because statistically, they're mostly straight white males as well. And they're also obsessed with fake ranks and titles. <laughs> Evola's philosophy also has the advantage of being unfalsifiable. Inspired by Gnosticism and Dadaism, Evola believed that the inherent truth of the universe that was illuminated to him was only accessible via transcendental acts. So why did he write so many books? The truths that allow us to understand the world of tradition are not those that can be learned or discussed. They either are or are not. We can only remember them. And that happens when we are freed from the obstacles represented by various human constructions. Chief among these are the results and methods of the authorized researchers. By wisdom, I mean that power that does not allow itself to speak, that manifests itself not by means of arguments and books, but through powerful actions. And the transcendental acts that Evola was the most excited about were mountain climbing and combat. And he was an avid mountain climber. I think the climber wants to hug the mountain. He wants to envelop that mountain within his body. He wants to make love to the mountain. Like literally the dude's entire philosophy was everything I am and everything I like is divinely confirmed as good and everything else is trash. Evola was also really into knight's orders, believing that the chivalric organization of the Teutonic Knights represented an optimal form of government organization. He was a major fan of the SS and the Romanian Iron Guard as an example of this ancient organizational form brought into the modern world. This idea was also described as Mannerbund, which can be translated as male society, and which we can see suggestions of in modern alt-right groups like the Proud Boys. Evola's love of knights leads directly into his anti-communism and anti-Semitism. The leader of the Romanian Iron Guard, Corneliu Codreanu, was one of Evola's heroes and Evola closely followed his anti-Semitic and anti-communist writings and actions. Codrianu had a clear idea of what a communist takeover in Romania would mean. The country's enslavement to the filthiest tyranny, the Talmudic Israelite tyranny. And Codrianu once wrote, In a year, I have learned enough anti-Semitism to last me for three lifetimes. And because Evola hated egalitarianism, he obviously hated communism. He believed that communism was the final de-evolution of civilization. Down from the strict masculine hierarchical order of divinely mandated monarchy into feminine equality. Idea and form are related to matter and nature. 
the same relation of a luminous, masculine, differentiating, individualizing, and life-giving principle in the face of an unstable, promiscuous, nightly, feminine principle. Hmm. Men as form and women as formless. Where have I heard that before? Evola would claim frequently that he was not a fascist. Despite this, he worked with fascists, he wrote for fascist newspapers, he wrote books widely celebrated by fascists, and he believed that fascism was the only hope for Europe against the demagoguery of the West and the communism of the East. In other words, kind of the Dave Rubin of his day. He believed that the most qualified rulers of a nation would be a divinely ordained order of knights that would form a divine monarchy. The resurgence of Rome should coincide with the formation of a true, sacral monarchy. And really, the differentiation between a monarchist and a fascist is pretty thin. They'll both take up arms against democracy with the same fervor, and the only real disagreement they have is if they should be ruled by an all-powerful demagogue or an all-powerful king. So that's the philosophy of Evola. And you can pretty obviously see why all of these ideas would be attractive to modern alt-right folks. Now real quick for a story about Avola that they probably don't like. In 1944, Avola escaped out of a window while his elderly mother held off the Allied military police that were coming to arrest him for working with the SS and with the fascist regime in Italy. Such a brave guy. He then fled to Vienna, and during an Allied bombing of the city, he decided to take a walk outside to ponder his destiny. During that walk, an Allied bomb went off and a piece of shrapnel struck him in the spine, rendering him paralyzed from the waist down for the rest of his life. What would have definitely been a debilitating injury in any case was certainly made no easier by his attitude. Remembering why I had willed it, i.e. the paralysis, and to understand its deeper meaning was to me the only thing that ultimately mattered, something far more important than to recover, to which I never really attributed much importance anyway. And like I mentioned before, his neo-fascist successors in Italy simplified his ideology down to a pretty bare understanding. Basically, it became just, fighting is good. We are not interested in seizing power, not even, per se, in establishing a new order. What interests us is combat, action in itself, the daily struggle to assert our own nature. So unsurprisingly, these guys never really affected any real political change. They committed numerous terrorist bombings that killed hundreds over the next decade after Evola's death. And then, like many of the neo-fascist groups we've seen in the United States recently, they dissolved due to infighting, killing many of their own in divisive bouts of group paranoia. All that esotericism and belief in a sense of transcendental knowledge ended up as... Fight Club, basically. And there's some pretty obvious comparisons you can make to the Proud Boys and all of that. As of today, November 21st, 2018, I'm officially disassociating myself from the Proud Boys. Evola's philosophy can be summarized as misanthropy repackaged as virtue, and insecurity masked with mystical individualist conservatism. His philosophy meets the psychological needs of the young white men who want confirmation of the divine hierarchical supremacy that Western culture has taught them that they are entitled to. For those that just evoke Evola's name as a symbol, points can be made by countering the well-worn whitewashing excuses for his fascism. But for those dedicated fans of Evola, you're probably as well off arguing with a creationist. The unfalsifiability of his ideology means they're probably not the kind of people to be convinced by facts or reason. Also, anyways, don't bother arguing with Nazis. Mm -hmm.
tough young guys with their sinewy bodies.